Hey YouTube, today we're going to talk about Super Hot. Now it really lets us extend the context length up to links that we're not used to, 8K or 16,000 tokens. We'll talk about what have been the challenges in doing this, what have we been trying to do to address the context length, and ultimately what ended up being the problem. So let's get started. So we just need to review a few key concepts before we can get into the power behind Super Hot. And the first thing to remember is that the attention layer has quadratic complexity, so it has some scaling issues, specifically with the context length or token count, in other words, and our embedding dimension. So if we double the number of tokens, it will take four times as long to compute and take up four times the memory. We also have a lack of extrapolation in our positional encoding. And if you would like to learn more about positional encoding, check out our video up uh, about it up here and also on landmark attention. But LLMs that have been trained with sinusoidal positional encoding have a lot of trouble extrapolating the next tokens beyond what it was trained to understand. And there are some techniques that have existed before Superhot, specifically Alibi and Landmark, where Landmark in particular did really let us extend the context in a simulated way, but it was very unreliable with how it relied on embeddings and so forth to actually try to extend the context. Where Alibi was perhaps a little more successful in a strict way where it did allow us to extend the context and consider the whole context, it, didn't, uh, it did introduce a bias where earlier tokens were not as heavily regarded as later tokens. We also need to understand the difference between softmax and ReLU, where ReLU is a type of neuron activation where up until a certain value, it's zero and then linear beyond that. So it would look like this, where if we have our X and Y, up until some point, it's zero and then it goes off linearly. This acts as what we call a, a change of basis function, where we can approximate any arbitrary function with some combination of these rel U's. And softmax takes any vector. So to make it easy on ourselves, we'll call it 95, uh, 5, and 0. And if we apply softmax to this, we get 0 0.95, 0 0.05, and 0. So softmax has taken this vector and made it sum to 1. And why we care about that is if we're trying to teach our model how to pick things, it's easier to have it on a normal distribution. And then finally, we have the dot product. And the dot product um, measures the angular distance between two vectors. So if you have a vector Q times a vector K, it's equal to the absolute value of Q times the, abs the absolute value of K times the cosine of the angle between Q and K. And this just produces a scalar where if they are orthogonal vectors, it's zero. So now let's move on and talk about what is positional encoding and how can we start to improve the problem here in positional encoding. So positional encoding, how, how do, can we start tackling this problem of positional encoding getting in the way of increasing context length? Well, as we mentioned before, sinusoidal positional encoding, which is the default one that we train our models on, just doesn't extrapolate well and it falters very quickly. So let's remind ourselves what positional encoding is for. So if we have some any number of input tokens, we have an, an, a matrix that we have embedded those tokens against. So if we have three tokens, the dog eats, we would convert these into tokens and just, it could be 101, 121, and 131. And don't pay any attention to those values. They're just totally made up, but they would get embedded into a matrix where if our uh, embedding dimension is three, we'd get a three by three matrix. So we would have values like potentially 1.21, 1 1.42, 1.11, and 2.36, uh, 0 0.13, 0 0.11, and so forth. And where the closeness tells you how similar are these tokens to one another. 
And but this doesn't tell us about positionality of the tokens. So what we now need to do is positionally encode it. And in positional encoding, we're adding signs times sum coefficient times its theta to even values and cosines to our odd values. And then in linear, so this is sinusoidal positional encoding, in linear, we're adding a linear bias. So instead of adding sine waves, we're adding some kind of linear bias instead. But this is weak, and what we'll learn about next is rotary encodings, where we're only really able to move this on a single axis. And so we're not able to embed as much information about our positionality as we could with rotary. But our solutions for this up until now have been alibi, which is the linear bias. And but this has a big weakness in that earlier tokens lose some of their context or importance as compared to the later tokens. Then we tried random positional encoding. So what happens if I have, I'm still only going to train 2048 tokens, but I'm going to show it tokens out to 8,196. I'm gonna show it what the encodings would look like out to 8,196. And I'm just gonna do it randomly. I'm going to pick random valid encodings for those tokens, sort them, add them back as I would normally positionally encode, and this works pretty well. This led naturally to shifted positional encoding, where I start by using encodings between 1 and 2048, but then in the next round I use 2 to 2049, and then 3 to 2050, and so forth. And this also helped the model to correctly learn what these positional encodings are. And I think this gives a hint to what's actually happening, um, but we'll get to that in the next section as well. But then we have log in scaling, where what we're really not, we're not actually attacking the positional encoding directly, rather we're scaling the output from attention. And this allows us to prevent the model from over favoring the encodings that it has already seen, but it's not as powerful as the other methods were. But in this, for the sake of completeness, I thought we should cover it at least a little bit. But now let's move on to rotary encodings and the power behind those. So what are rotary positional embeddings? Well, just like sinusoidal or linear biases, we're wanting to know something about the positionality of our tokens. So we want to know, are we at the first or the second or the third token? But with these, we can only know something about the position based on some uh, angle on a single axis. But what we'd like to be able to do is embed slightly more information than that and do it by perhaps a rotation, where if we have two axes, we'd like to be able to rotate around both of those axes. So if we remember what embedding space is, it is a space telling us who is related to who. So if we imagine it on a sphere, we could have things clustered here, and these could be car concepts. We could have things clustered here. These could be names. And once we've pulled those out for our tokens, we'd like to be able to rotate them in that space and embed our positional in information that way. And why we care about this is because relative versus absolute encoding. So we don't want to only know, are we at the fourth token? We also want to know how far apart are the fourth and 11th tokens. And why this is important is this should, in theory, give our model the ability to extrapolate into higher token counts. But this doesn't seem to be the case. And when we get into super hot, we'll see why. But what uh, rotary encoding, how rotary encoding does this is through the dot product, where when we compute our attention scores, the dot product falls out all of this rotation and only tells us the distance between the tokens as a function of those degrees. So you get that same notion of relative and an absolute position by the dot product. So now let's move on to super hot and how it takes advantage of this to really increase the context length.
So what is actually happening in our positional encoding? Why is it not extrapolating? Well, what SuperHot has found is that really what it's doing is it's memorizing all of the tokens in its positional encoding. So basically the model has memorized the tokens and their positional encoding. So when we try to move past that, it just falls apart. So what this really means is that all of this hope about the absolute and relative positioning really didn't happen. And so this means that we can take advantage of our rotary positional embeddings and the additional context that we get from this rotation around these axes to kind of cheat and take advantage of this now to stretch out our encoding. So if we have some token count that we've learned out to out to say L, and we would embed at position one and at two and three, and this is our positional encoding. What if we just repeated it a few times? So let's say we wanted to have four times our token count. So all we would do is we would repeat the uh, positional encodings four times for each. So for the first token, it would get the first uh, positional encoding and the same for the second token and the third token and the fourth token. But then the fourth, uh, fifth token would get the second encoding and so forth. And this just works. It does. Because as we've learned, this relative and absolute positioning never really mattered. So what ultimately matters is that there is some sense of positionality. And because of these rotary embeddings, we can take advantage of that for the model to still be able to understand the whole context. And that's how SuperHot is really taking advantage of this to extend the token context well beyond uh, what the model was trained for. And this is probably honestly how GPT is even doing this. And this does seem to work out to 16K or even 32K context. So um, this has been a very powerful change and this is really all it took. If this is helpful, please like and subscribe, and please let us know in the comments below what you'd like to hear about next, and tune in next time when we're gonna talk about LLMs from start to finish. So how do they work through the entire pipeline? See y'all next time.